<laughs> I just wanted to know what your um, biggest takeaway was from Pope Francis's visits to the U.S. Like what just hit home for you? So I know I listened to him, and I was like, he's talking about Frank and Christie right now. He's talking about the lady, and I love it. So I would love to hear from you what your takeaways were. I guess I've already uh, shared some of uh, things that impress me. Uh, I guess as you ask that question, what comes to mind is that Francis, it seems to me, Pope Francis knew to listen. Um, there's been a lot of talk about discomfort with things he says, things he's reported to have said, things he's written, um, his style, etc. Um, but we know for us in Reagan Christie, he's the vicar of Christ. He's the Pope. And I think he was here to show us that he cares about us, and he loves us, and he's with us. So there was one particular point, I think actually Father Jason and I uh, commented on this uh, in the community a couple days ago. Um, Saturday night in Philadelphia, in the Festival of the Families, he didn't give his prepared remarks. In fact, he didn't even look at his notes as he spoke. And if you go on Zenith, I'm sure most all of you get Zenith, um, a couple days ago, you can see both the prepared remarks and what he delivered. And his prepared remarks have a little bit of a different tone and a little bit of a different focus. And yet what he delivered was exactly what we needed to hear. And I think it was his being docile with the Holy Spirit, as Father Michael so well expressed. So for me, it was just encouraging and inspiring to see, um, to see the Pope for who we believe he is and to see him so in tune with the Holy Spirit. It just gave me kind of a, you might say, a human you know, shot in the arm of confidence. That would be my first impression. The nice thing about going second is you can really think about it. <laughs> um, two things. One, um, one thing that the first, uh, I was formulating that in my mind and then we were at this uh, walking with purpose luncheon in, in Stanford and Bishop Caggiano gave the talk and it was remarkable and Essentially what he said was, why is everybody so moved by Pope Francis? And it's not what you think it is. Did you say something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and really what I was thinking at the end of the day is the Lord, is, is he's met the Lord, right? I'm sure you shared that part. And so I think that that's, that was really my, my takeaway. And I think when we think about evangelization in our, as we're here gathered to, to look at that, we can perhaps make it into some big complicated thing that is is large and and grand and, and this big enterprise. <laughs> Whereas really it's meeting Jesus, falling in love with him, sharing that story with others. And that the way you act with your members of your family, with the people you work with with the apostle that you do, the fact that you've encountered the Lord in prayer through the spirituality of Reverend Christie, that is what um, changes hearts. Not Twitter, sorry. I mean, you know, not these things, but it's the encounter with the Lord that we give to others. That's what changes. So my own personal takeaway was I have to continue to seek Him and follow Him. And I think as we do that, that's what we, we strive to bring others. Vantage of one third. <laughs> I think Fran Pope Francis has suffered a lot. If you haven't read his life, get a book and read his life. Um, and I think that's why we see in him such a pastor and so much compassion as we prepare to live the year of mercy. So, Father Jason just said trigger that. It's, I think um, he's very, he's very real. Yeah. So I'd like to, 
I'd like to ask a little bit about the renewal process. So we've seen some beautiful fruits come out of the renewal process, and we know that the Vatican had assigned someone to work with the Legionaries of Christ. We know that the Constitution was was looked at again and, and some revisions were made. So can you just speak to where you we are in the process? Is, is the process now complete? Is there more still to come? Or you know, are we now, uh, well, for those of us that don't follow this daily, perhaps you can just tell us how it's going for, for you and, and where we all should believe that we are at this point. I'm just, just going to cheat and reiterate what, what Mary said earlier today, which is that, uh, no, it's not done, but we're getting close to the end. We're now in the heart of the most important part of the renewal for the lady, for you. And that's going over the, the statutes, which, curiously enough, most of you have never seen. And I won't go into all the reasons for that, but just... It used to be a document that we could pass around readily and all that sort of thing. So um, I would say take advantage of the next few months. Mary, how many months do we have to do that? Is it just maybe three months for the uh, to do it in localities? And then the national happens when? So in March, yes. So in March, uh, Representatives of every locality will come together after you completed your reflections in the fall, um, and then they will rep they will choose representatives to go to Rome, and everything that's done at a uh, at the national level as well as locality level will be sent on, but especially the reflections that are concluded at a national level are sent on with representatives to Rome. They make the final um, recommendations and present the final document uh, for the Holy See to approve. So we're in that last year, is that right, Mary? And uh, the next three months are really important. If you haven't been able to participate that much up until now for whatever reason, now's the time. And now's the time to engage your fellow regular Christian members as well, because this is what you're living. documents and, and discussing them? That's what we're doing here in uh, our sections. New Jersey, I think, of the same thing. That's what we recommend. You need to do what you can do. If it's not working at a team level, find another way to do it. But it would have just started. BJ, I don't think this is not something that everybody's really advanced on because it just began at the end of the summer, right? Okay, thanks. Let's let Mary add a couple of notes here. Okay, so um, so <clears throat> the big picture is that we're all working on this. The fathers are finished, the consecrated are finished, we're in our portion of it. So we looked at, um, as I s explained earlier, looking at things existing in the church, just about movements in general. So that's what we did in phase one, just getting a sense of where do we fit in this family, um, of the universal church. And really, frankly, one of the interesting points was it's not something strange and weird. Uh, this is what, as a Catholic, as a baptized Catholic, every person is called to be and to do. But for us, it's a, it's a great vocation, a great blessing and gift because Rain and Christy beautifully facilitates our doing all of that um, that we're called to do as baptized Catholics. And even in the Pope's, um, what is it, Gaudium? Evangelium. Yes, thank you. Um, and when, when we were going through it on our him, I just sat there like a bobblehead, smiling and nodding. I was like, yup, doing it, doing it, doing it. And it was all because of Brandon Christie. So that may be your experience as well. So, um, but again, so phase one was just looking at the reality of, of what we're called to, period. And now, this phase that we've just begun is our chance to say, essentially, 
how has this been truly lived within my own life personally? And we're reflecting that back because the, um, the Holy See has basically said to us, who are you? And they're giving us this unique chance to express that. And we're going to do that um, hopefully quickly. It's, it's a lot to get through. Don't feel like, like I said earlier, I think, that you have to be reinventing the wheel. If you're going through these and you're just reading them and it sounds great and you all feel that way, it's okay to move on to the next one. Don't think you need to get into some heated discussion and, you know, and just move on. Just savor it. Just, you know, if, if it touches you in some way, go around. The Father's recommended going, like, around in a circle. Let everybody share a little bit. Don't be a time hog. Know that you want to give everybody a chance. Um, it's not a time for debate, nor is it a time for consensus. You don't need to agree on everything. Mention how it's touched you. If, if you're not feeling like anything particular, you can let it go. And um, so you don't have to rush through it, but don't belabor the point either, okay? Um, we do have a time frame. We do need to move. Each month, I need to be getting reports from the team leaders, and that's something I've, I've sent out. I will resend, and there should be a secretary in each team just recording if there is a recommendation for change on those statute change recommendations, if you want to change a change, um, record that vote on it, and then that will come through me and go to national. And then that's what they're going to um, sift through. And then at national, if there is a common thread of recommendations on certain points, that then will be discussed on the national level and then presented internationally in Rome, okay? Bringing everyone from around the world together. So again, if there's something that the Holy Spirit wants to say, the understanding is that's how it'll be happening, okay? Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Um, just one quick parenthesis is that if I understand correctly, there will be some final meetings among all the members of the movement, the representatives of all the members of the movement, once this phase of the first and second stage have concluded to determine the final governance structure of the entire movement. While some of that might seem to be, I don't know, um, logical or, or some of that thing we'll just do what we've always done, that needs to be seen, and until that's seen, in some sense, the, the ultimate renewal is not complete. So we're getting there. It's church to meetings. I'm Evelyn, and my question to you both fathers are, is this, um, what do you, what can you suggest we can do for members of our section who are not able to attend the encounter? How can we care for them? <laughs> well, the nice thing uh, about being under Father Edward these last two years, I never had to worry about that. <laughs> um, well, I think first of all is, I think um, that every team leader needs to have a real heart of shepherd, right? And, sure. Because of conflicts and circumstances, well, uh, so how can we help them become active in an in, in encounter? Well, I think, you know, the, the, again, going to modern technology, Skype is a wonderful thing um, in order to call it Skype it. And time conflict. Well, if they can't go, they can't go. And that's just the, I mean, they have to figure out how to get home. I can't solve it for them. Um, I'm doing a terrible job answering this question. How can we care for them outside the encounter? That's my question. Oh, I got it. All right, so, well, all the Jason thinks about this. 
<laughs> no, I think that I know some men's teams that actually do their encounters both by Skype, even when they're when they're traveling with the call in. So there are other ways to connect to the encounter. The encounter though has never been considered the essence of regular Christian. It's one of the primary spiritual team activities, but you don't have to do an encounter to be a regular Christian member. So there are people out there who are in that situation, probably many more than we realize. And I think the key then is that those who are leading the section make sure that they, there are enough integration activities and outreach activities and activities where you bring the whole section together. So somebody who's not able to do regular encounters does have experience of the other members. Beyond that, it's a question of spiritual direction and personal dedication to their, their own prayer life. Um, another beautiful thing I think that we want to keep an eye on, and hopefully all participate, especially now that the foundation has challenged us with the, uh, the, the modern media, is that we need to write more spirituality. There was a time when you had a lot of letters to read, and spirituality, our sea spirituality was at your fingertips. That time is no more. We have very little now. So we need to write, we need to produce, we need to have, I don't know, websites and things that have recorded talks, um, Twitter, and whatever else works. So that would be my answer, I think. You know, what Father Jason said in the beginning was true. It's about being a shepherd. It's about those who are leading the section to keep an eye out for those who can't have a regular team life and make sure that they're really staying connected to yearly spiritual exercises, uh, activities that just bring people together for integration purposes, uh, activities where there's some formation or monthly retreats, and you pray for each other. Fathers, can you talk about Lucy's initiative with Father Park Tunic and our, <coughs> our online spirituality center? Because that's a great gift with study guides and everything and retreats. Yeah, this is the online... Is everybody aware of the online study center that exists that's been probably in existence for, what, a couple of years now? At least Lucy Horner has been uh, yes. consecrated. She's been doing a fabulous job of that. Um, there's a lot of materials that she's producing along with Father Park Tunic. And they're especially for people in the diaspora, those who are outside of regular contact with the consecrated and legionaries. But obviously this would apply for those who can't make regular meetings. I think uh, Alan had a question. Uh, Jason. <laughs> Okay. I used to have a Facebook page uh, several years ago. I took it down because um, I, I don't think I was protecting it properly, so all kinds of messages were coming on there from people I didn't even know. Um, but, I, but I'm back to it again. I just put a page up just so I could access mainly our sites. You know. And um, So there's nothing on mine right now. So my question is this, and uh, it's probably a very question, but could I represent my pet page, a fire, let's say, on a Facebook page, and maybe I also receive Father Michael Slimey's daily messages, a link for that? But not, it wouldn't be just links, it would be... Yeah, and you then, could do that. Okay, and then you could, could do that. Okay. So. Yeah, so when you, if you follow the um, Say Father Michael's <laughs> videos, when they come up in your newsfeed, if you just push share, there's a little thing, a little button there, you just say share, that will share that and it will put onto you, go onto your page. And then plus, and then everybody who's following you in, in your newsfeed, because your Facebook page is like your newspaper, right? And then that will jump into their newsfeed, and then they will, will see it that way. And it will go on. Facebook, if you think of it as a book, right? The first book is your, the first page of the newspaper is what's called your wall. So that's what people will see. It has all the things that most current in your photo. You flip that over as your news feed, which only you see, right? But everybody else that you share it with that's following, that's friends with you, 
will see that in their, in their feed and everything that you share. If you have people that are posting things, things that are popping up in your news feed that you don't like from people, you can just, there's a little button there, and here's where I would recommend the Google question. You go in there and you can block that so you don't see things from certain people themselves. So, uh, yeah. And so if I share this on a page, it would not just come up as a link. Yep. That yeah, will come up as your picture. Yeah. Uh -oh. The whole the whole thing just snaps right in. It's amazing. Zuckerberg just got everything. <laughs> Whatever his name is. <laughs> Mark. A little Mark. All right, time for maybe one last question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um I'd like to ask, what is um, considered uh, resources for uh, spiritual reading? Like we used to be able to have, you know, a, a continuous list of uh, spiritual reading, good spiritual reading that we uh, that we could tap into as regular Christian members. Yeah, and that goes back to Father Edward's point where I'm so glad Father said he's been writing great about the spirituality right now we've had a lot of time. <laughs> no, I really, I think really what, it might be nice for everybody in their own spiritual direction with their spiritual director to go over and ask that question. Like what would be some good spiritual reading because people can be at different points in their spiritual life. And so it might, you know, just to recommend top 10 books right now would be just in general, but it might be good for each person individually what, where they're at to, to take a look at that and to, to take this calling uh, seriously because spiritual reading is such a great step to grow spiritually. It is what can really kindle the fire uh, within us. We have to be, St. Paul says, whatever is good, noble, just, pure, worthy of praise, we have to surround ourselves with these things. And spiritual reading is just is that. So. Yes. <laughs> I just want to embarrass Father Edward quick before going. So I don't get to do this often. <laughs> no, no it, uh, it's been a real pleasure working with Father Edward in these last few years. Um, when I joined the Legion back in 1994, on this very stage, I received my cassock, um, and uh, you know, I've lived over half my life as a legionary, and Father Edward was the priest that mentored me during that first, uh, that first summer candidacy, and then it kind of came full circle these last few years in New York, and uh, if I could be just half the section director Father Edward was, uh, I would be very grateful. And um, so, you know, uh, Father, thank you so much for everything you've done, and um, we're just going to try to continue to build on all the good work that you will be doing as well. If I continue to send us vocations like this, we're in good shape. <laughs> I'm going to join the uh, section director uh, in the New York area, and uh, all I can say is that um, I've learned a lot, and I've seen a lot of growth, and I've seen us take steps, slow steps, but necessarily slow steps in the And I've seen some great people enter the movement, and I've seen some great momentum gather. So uh, I'm very excited about um, stepping back and letting you do what uh, you do best, which is to continue what we did today, right? To evangelize and to live your faith in the full, and to live holiness and to, to share it. Share it. I think, Robert, we're just going to say a couple words. Maybe this is uh, the beginning or the end of it. Um, I think some notes here, but I'm probably not going to use them. Um, I was just very impressed today at uh, the depth, the depth of what was shared. Um, I don't think any of us would conclude that we 
I've been through a few textbooks today on how to and how to and how to, so maybe the word training was misleading. But I think the most important part of being a regular Christian, of evangelizing, has been covered because the heart's been covered. It has been done in different ways. In some sense, we couldn't have um, orchestrated this if we had tried. And we, we did try. <laughs> but it worked out so that we got some very different angles. So I think we have a much broader perspective. I was listening very closely and taking notes as Father Jason spoke. And uh, I'm going to have to see some of those videos again to see, <laughs> to capture all that was there. But. Um, Definitely. I mean, I know in my, in my new assignment now, I've got to use those means. I've been resisting for years. And now I realize it's been an omission. Uh, even though I, when I worked with kids, I used to call these things diabolical devices. <laughs> well, they don't have to be diabolical. They can be heavenly, and they can be evangelizing devices. So, I would say with, with everything we've seen, and, and I thank all the, those who are presented, and, and, and in a moment we'll get to those who have not necessarily all presented, but have been very present and working behind the scenes. We'll speak to them in a moment, but, um, you know, the God ask. Imagine next year if we were due to do another convention like this here in Cheshire, and you were all to do the God ask to say five or six people. And two or three of those people said yes. We would have a packed auditorium and the brothers would be sitting on the floor. That would be a good problem. So it's simple. But it doesn't begin with the big ask, it begins with the small ask. With that perseverance that Val talked about. Not giving up on people. Being there for them, loving them. Father Sean spoke to us and uh, about the beauty of small teams, and we just a moment ago had that experience. I think as you went off into small groups, how much can be shared, and how much you inspire each other and and trigger new thoughts and, and, and invite each other to go deeper. That's a part of our methodology. That's part of who we are. So it's great to see that not only can you do that, but that we're ready to do that more and more with more and more people. It's got to be part of everything we do. If we don't get to the small group, then we're left on our morning and we feel alone. We don't get to the small groups and people don't experience right and Christy they don't experience us. And then, you know, I think what Cecile added to that presentation was, was really critical. Because small groups isn't just about getting people to feel good about each other. It's about helping them open their hearts and to feel the need of others. And together to reach out. To be able to prepare for and do a follow-up on missions of all sorts. So, thank you for that. that you might say very, it might seem simple, but it's not easy. If you're standing next to two people who are doing it with you, it's a thousand times easier. Mary talked to us about, not just about the Redmond Christie renewal, but she talked about, really, for me, about how to evangelize from the heart, to forget ourselves, and to be ready to let God challenge you. And if you're speaking from the heart, and I think she wasn't the only one to say this, if you're speaking from the heart, things flow. So let's let it flow. Let's let the Lord work. Let's give him a few more mouths and a few more hearts to work. <laughs> Father Jason, when he spoke about the social media, one, one more thing, I just, and this isn't to, to tease him, but... Um, He's very humble about what he does on that social media. We all know that he is number two only to the Pope. The <laughs> Instagram has been considered by many to be. And, and yet, 
the things he puts on there are so diverse and so um, engaging. When I was with those university students this past week, um, I told them about Father Jason's, and they were awed by it. And they were, you already have more followers because of that. Huh? Thank me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that enough. But <laughs> uh, so let's start thinking outside the box. We want to evangelize. We're excited about what the Pope has said and what he's done. We're excited about this gathering of family. Let's communicate. It does take a little more time. Let's manage that. And of course, Father Michael's sign. I can't say enough about Father Michael's testimony, I would just like to say that if, if what he says is true, and it is, um, then we're going to be hearing a lot more from a lot of people. Because he doesn't like to speak. He did as a child. And he said, you know, you're going to have excuses, like I stutter. When I was in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, I stuttered terribly. They wouldn't let me study language until I got to high school. The only decision I made in high school vocationally was not to do anything that required me to learn languages or speak much. <laughs> Come Holy Spirit. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's take what Father Michael has not only said with his words, but I think he showed us more with uh, the way he spoke to us. The truth and the beauty communicating the word from the heart. And finally, Tony, thank you so much for being with us. Tony, um, I don't know if you understand what Tony does. Tony not only represents a whole community single-handedly, but he works in three different parishes, does the job of three different DREs or other uh, similar positions, and moves around a lot. He has done a tremendous amount to help the regular Christian movement have a face and be respected within the Archdiocese of New York. And that's simply because he loves the movement, and he's not afraid to talk about the movement. So, what he said about personal testimony goes for any time we talk about the movement. You're ready, Christy? What's that? How often do we take advantage of that question? What's that? Let me tell you what it is. Give them something that makes them want more. And obviously, for any of this to work, um, we not only have to develop our own little um, testimony, which from what I could see went pretty well. I don't know if you all finished, but the way that I witnessed it pretty good. But we need to work on our own homes. So let's pray for each other. Let's pray for each other that we become the evangelized the apostles that God has called us to be. So I'm going to hand the mic over here to uh, our, our welcome Father Jason as our new section director for Connecticut and New York. You did a great job. Um, he supported us beautifully over the years and probably, actually, you know he's the senior member of the community <laughs> as regards living and working in New York. He's going on 67 years, what was it? He's going on quite a few years. He's persevering, so maybe we all persevere. Thanks for your attention. And of course, we have to thank Rob for uh, being a great MC, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, let's end with the blessing. There's a wonderful prayer to our Blessed Mother here at the end of Evangelic Gaudium of the gospel that Pope Francis uh, wrote, and I'm so glad he brought in the image of Mary, so I'll just use that as my, my prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Mary, Virgin and Mother, you who moved by the Holy Spirit, welcome the word of life in the depths of your humble faith. As you gave yourself completely to the Eternal One, help us to say our own yes to the urgent call, as pressing as ever, to pray, proclaim the good news of Jesus. Filled with Christ's presence, you brought joy to John the Baptist, making him exult in the womb of his mother. Brimming over with joy, you sang of the great things that God has done. Standing at the foot of the cross with unyielding faith, you received the joyful comfort of the resurrection. 
and joined the disciples in awaiting the Spirit so that the evangelizing church might be born. Obtain for us now a new ardor, born of the resurrection, that we may bring to all the gospel of life which triumphs over death. Give us a holy courage to seek new paths. The gifts of unfading beauty may reach every man and woman. Virgin of listening and contemplation, mother of love, bride of the eternal wedding feast, pray for the church, whose pure icon you are, that she may never be closed in on herself or lose her passion for establishing God's kingdom. Star of the new evangelization, help us to bear radiant witness to communion service, ardent and generous faith, justice and love of the poor, that the joy of the gospel may reach to the ends of the earth, illuminating even the fringes of our world. Mother of the living gospel, wellspring of happiness for God's little ones, pray for us. Amen. Alleluia. <clears throat>